Good morning, everyone. Hopefully you are all doing well on this lovely Thursday morning. My name is Jen, and welcome to a lovely edition of our Aquarium Online Academy. And today we're going to be talking about kelp forests and conservation. Now, if you happen to have been tuning in earlier today, you may have heard my colleague Cynthia talk a little bit about kelp forests in our Draw With Me class. And so we're going to keep that kelp forest theme going today. And so if you do have any questions, feel free to go on ahead and text them on in. I have Alicia that's going to be supporting me today with all of these lovely images. And Cynthia's at our computer um, bringing all those wonderful questions on in. So if you do have any, feel free to go on ahead and text us down below 562-286-1838. And if you happen to be watching this later on, on the 16th between uh, 10 and 1030 is when we are currently live, you can always feel free to email us down below at live at lbaop.org. Um, so as we go on ahead and chat a little bit about kelp force today, if you have any thoughts, if you have any memories that you're like, oh my goodness, I'm actually quite familiar about kelp forests, and I remember a time when I uh, went down to the coast and saw a whole bunch washed up on shore. Or maybe if you're like, I've heard about these kelp forests, and I've never been and always wanted to go, right? I'd love to hear any kind of stories that you want to share, any kind of aspirations, right? Things that you're hoping to do someday. Um, I know one of my friends in Brazil, he loves seaweed and algae, and it's always been one of his dreams to scuba dive here off the California coast inside of kind of like what we have here, back behind me at our Blue Cavern exhibit, where we have all of this glorious kelp we have different kinds here, um, and so it'd be kind of cool to be able to, to dive in there, right? So feel free to send in any kind of stories or questions that you might have. Now, do remember that texting rates do apply, so if you are a younger viewer today, make sure that you get an adult's permission beforehand. So let's go on ahead and let's talk about one of my favorite topics, algae. So we think about we have different varieties of algae right here. What do you notice about these algae? Hmm. Well, something that I see is that they are different colors, right? We have some that are kind of a, a darker green back here. We have some here that are more like olive green, depending upon the kinds of olives that you like to eat, right? And then we also have right over here, it's almost kind of like lime green in color. Now, these algae can come in a wide variety of colors. The ones that we have here happen to be, well, more of the brown variety, but there also happens to be red algae, and some of these red algae are dark red. Others are bright pink and anywhere in between. And then there are also the green algae too. And also, those can vary too. Now, these definitely do look a little bit green, but their main pigments that are inside of them that make them the majority of the color that they are, in this case, are going to be brown. But the green ones, they can be super bright green, kind of like our friend right here, to almost a forest green. So these algae are incredibly colorful, and I'm excited to share with you one of the major ones off of our coast, a particular type of kelp called giant kelp. So let's go on ahead and put on those algae hats, because everyone has an algae hat at home, right? I hope so, right? And we're gonna go on ahead and kind of think of ourselves as underneath our kelp forest here. Now this is one of my favorite parts of living off of California, is it's a literal underwater forest. Isn't that cool? So you can imagine yourselves underneath the water here. Ah, a nice, cool, crisp, maybe 55, 57 degree water. So a little bit on the chillier side, right? But what do you notice these kelp doing right now? Hmm. Well, I almost feel inspired by them. I'm doing it too, right? Kind of swaying back and forth. Ah, that sunlight, so bright, right? But we can see all of that sun shining down through our kelp forest here. Now, if we look a little bit further back, we can see that we have tons of kelp, right, growing all together in all of these bunches that we see all around. Now, this kelp is swaying because it is flexible, and that's actually one of the main differences between algae and plants. Plants, they have those woody stems. That means that they are very rigid, right? They can't move a whole lot. You know, if you go on ahead and you try to bend a branch, it's a little bit bendy, but eventually it it cracks, right? Algae, they don't have to worry about that. These kelp right here, they can bend and sway, and they are incredibly flexible. Mm -hmm. 
that helps them to be able to sway with the with the with the water. So if there ever happens to be a storm that comes by, eh, not to worry. These kelp right here are incredibly resilient, meaning that they can tackle practically anything that the ocean can can give them, almost everything. As today we are talking about kelp forest and conservation, of course, and we'll get into the conservation aspect later. But let's go ahead and see what we can figure out too, what else makes algae special. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna grab a small piece of our algae. It's not real algae though, but it's fake algae. But we can talk a little bit about some of those parts. But before I do so, looks like Seymour is asking, have you been diving in a kelp forest and what's your favorite place to dive? Oh, Seymour, that's a great question. I have dove in a kelp forest before. Uh, I want to make sure I have my, my, uh, my dive knife, though, with me, because sometimes as you're kind of diving through, I don't always see these fun friends, but I definitely can get caught in some of that algae, and so can't really see where some of that algae is to take it off your tank, so I have a little knife sometimes. I can cut myself free to continue on on my adventure, and... I wish I could see some of these sea lions. I don't get to see them when I'm out diving. A lot of times though, I'll see sharks, which are really cool that are in the area and a ton of different fish, kind of like what we have here in another one of our locations called Amber Forest. And believe it or not, I used to be a volunteer here when I was a teenager, and that's when I first started diving. And when I'd volunteer here, I'd get here early because I lived kind of far away, and I would sit and I would actually stare at all the different fish in here and I would just learn them because I knew I'd probably see these animals diving and I would dive near my house. So um, some of my favorite sites are actually in Laguna Beach because that's where I originally started diving. And so it was really cool to be able to learn a lot of the animals here and then apply them to when I saw them out in the, out in the wild, right? Out in our oceans um, in some kelp forest habitat. So hopefully see more that answers your question. Um, but it's a really cool and unique environment. So I'm gonna bring up a piece of kelp right here. Once again, this is our model kelp. So you may see some like sticky parts right here, but this is basically our seaweed, right? So here we have our large algae and it goes, and it goes, and it goes all the way to here. Now, we talked a little bit earlier about one of the differences between algae and, algae and plants being that plants have that woody stem, right? And these algae don't. It's very super flexible, right? Um, and the way that they actually get their nutrients is completely different too. So for plants, where do they get their nutrients from? The soil, right? So the water and that soil mix and they're able to slurp up all of those delicious nutrients right from those roots and bring it to the rest of the plant, right? Maybe through the, the xylem and phloem process within the actual woody stem portion. But if we think about these algae right here, well, this little thing that looks kind of like a root, but it actually isn't. This is called a hold fast. That does exactly pretty much what the name implies, right? It holds down fast and it holds onto something hard like a rock. And let's see if we can kind of see it a little bit here. Aha, here's one, right? You can see a little hold fast right there. So it's really just for them to be able to grip onto something hard. So that way, you know, they have to deal with that swaying, that hold fast will kind of anchor them in place. Now, sometimes during stormy events, these hold fasts will, well, not hold on and they'll pop off and eventually they'll make their way, they'll tumble away onto the beach where we see them a lot of times. But out in the wild, it's really good to help them hold on to these rocks. Now, that's pretty much the main purpose of that hold fast. How do you think the seaweed might get the nutrients that it needs to survive? Hmm. Well, we have a few more parts to it. We have the blade right here, which is kind of like the stem. But, oh, I'm sorry, we have the stipe right here, which is the stem that you might think of on a plant. But we have these blades right here, which are kind of like the leaves that you would think of on an actual plant. Now, these blades are the parts that actually are able to kind of absorb a lot of those really neat nutrients from the water itself. Now, remember, our algae are a little different, right? They actually live in the water, in salt water. And so all of those beautiful blades are getting those nutrients directly from the water. But also, guess what? They're using that sunlight too, right? To be able to do something that algae and plants both do, which is to photosynthesize. So they both have that chlorophyll inside of them that helps them 
to give them, one, that pigment color, but two, allows them to be able to survive and thrive here in our oceans. Now, what's really crazy is that these giant kelp grow up to two feet a day. So they can grow ton and ton and ton and be super high, super high up and super tall in our oceans there. So, but if we think about it, if this algae grows up to two feet a day, and there's a lot to it, right? We can see all of these parts. Oh, and could you imagine all of these clumps? That's a lot of that kelp, a lot of that seaweed that's moving around. And it's all trying to get the sun. But as it grows, just like how normal plants grow, right? If, if these stems are not woody, so it doesn't help them stand straight up, and it's super bendy, how do you think a seaweed might be able to, well, kind of support itself, help it to stay afloat to maximize the sunlight that's above? Hmm. Well, it's a little hard to see in these pictures, but if we look up close on our seaweed, we have these little round parts right here. These are basically called nematocysts or air bladders, which means that inside of this little puffy part right here is air. So that air helps our kelp to be able to stay afloat in the water, almost like little teeny tiny balloons for each individual blade. So that way they can maximize the amount of sunlight that's around them. Isn't that incredible? Ah, oh, I know, isn't algae the greatest? I know, I know, that's why you tuned in, right? <laughs> so now let's go on ahead and maybe let's go on back to um, either amber forest so we can get a chance to see a little bit of that kelp uh, with actual animals in it. And I'm gonna step off to the side real quick and move my kelp along too. And I want you to just take note, right? We talked a lot about the kelp itself, which is the basis of that entire kelp forest. Now here, it's not as densely populated as what we've been seeing, but in a kelp forest, it's not always super dense. Maybe there's a few, you know, blades here and there, and maybe it just kind of skirts up top. But believe it or not, there are actually different kinds of zones in the kelp forest ecosystem. So, and these zones, much like if you think about a forest on land, right, has different zones, um, same thing in the ocean. So if we think about our forest, right, we have lots of trees and those trees can have the canopy, which is basically like the very tippy top of all of those trees, right? Well, we have canopies here in our kelp forest too, right up here at the very top. Now, much like how canopies can go on ahead and provide, well, brings up a question. What does a canopy provide for animals? What function does it serve? Hmm. I can see it right up here, at least the canopy within our kelp. Protection, right? So this kelp does the exact same thing, just like how uh, forests on land, right? That canopy uh, helps protect a lot of birds and a lot of animals and provides habitat for them. Same thing for our ocean animals here too. That canopy helps provide a lot of kind of protection and habitat space for not only larger rockfish like this friend right here, but also a lot of schooling fish too. Now, as we kind of move down our kelp forest here, right, we can see that maybe some of them live in the very middle where maybe they don't need as much protection, right? And they're okay with being out and about. But then there are also those that live at the very base. Now that hold fast that we mentioned was pretty small. We saw it was pretty small. But let me show you a piece of a hold fast that actually is much larger and one found in real life. Now here is just one example of a hold fast. This is only a piece. So this is, you know, quite large in size. And if you get a chance to look, and I might actually put this on our document camera, there are tons and tons of holes that are through this. It's tricky to see. So let's go on ahead and move over to our, our document camera and maybe we can check it out together. So I'm going to turn it on real quick. Aha, there we go. And maybe we can get a chance to see all of these different pieces or parts that's all about our hold fast. Now, many of these animals go on ahead and they're able to utilize and live inside of this hold fast.
Um, it's a little bit dark on this side. Maybe I can move our light a little bit so you can see a shadow and you can see how dense it is. But if I go on ahead and I scooch on in, boop, here, oh, maybe a little further out. <laughs> Whoop. Sorry, friends. All right, there we go. You can get a chance to see how there's tons of pieces and there's an entire network of parts all inside here, right? And here you can actually see some remnants of different kinds of algae that are inside. But all of these nooks and crannies are great spots for all these animals to be able to live. So we're thinking animals on a much smaller scale when we're talking about animals, right? We're talking about maybe brittle stars that are really small, so really teeny tiny, almost squiggly like sea stars that live in here. We're seeing little bits of other kinds of algae that grow on this algae right here. We might see a baby octopus that might live in there too, right? Or maybe some snails. There are so many different kinds of baby animals that take advantage of this network of almost like, you know, um, of a root system that they can kind of hide and shelter and maybe eat some morsels there too, which is kind of cool. So once again, if you do have any questions, feel free to go on ahead and text them on in as we go on ahead and talk a little bit about kelp today. Now, we've been talking a little bit about how all of the different parts of the kelp, right, can provide a home for a wide variety of animals depending upon what their needs are. Now, not only does it provide that habitat or protection, but for some it even provides food. Can you think of any animals that maybe enjoy eating kelp? Aside from us, maybe. Hmm. Well, I'm thinking of quintessential sea anemone or sea urchin, right? The, the purple pokey friend. And I can also think of maybe some kelp crabs too and some kelp snails. So there's a wide variety of animals that love to eat kelp. Now, some of them actually live on the different blades of kelp. Um, other times, like the sea urchin, even though it's so beautifully laid on a piece of kelp right here on a rock, Many times uh, these sea urchins will eat basically pieces of kelp that have fallen off and they'll eat all of those slowly rotting pieces of kelp. And that's one way that they can uh, gain nutrition or and gain a good food sources from a lot of that falling kelp. Now, if there doesn't happen to be enough of that falling kelp, um, then they will go on ahead and eat the live kelp and maybe eat the hold fast, right, and eat other parts of that kelp to survive. But they like to eat a lot of drift kelp. While other animals, like our kelp crab, they'll live actually on it to eat some of the kelp to give it that color. Here's a nice picture of a kelp crab right here. See how well it blends into that seaweed? It's so hard to tell the difference, and they get a lot of that color from the seaweed that they eat. There's other animals like amphipods that will use kelp blades as their home. They'll wrap themselves up in it like a little burrito and they'll keep an opening up top and then they can jet out, do what they need to, and then come back in to that little safe and secure kelp envelope that they made for themselves. There's a ton of different ways that animals can use kelp in their everyday lives. Now we as humans, we too can use kelp in our everyday lives too. Now, yes, we know that maybe one way could be eating it, right? Yum, 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 yum. Eating it is always a very delicious and nutritious way to go about it. And there are a lot of really neat kelp products or seaweed products out there, like there's seaweed salsas now that you could have, um, as well, you know, as well as a lot of other ways that you can eat seaweeds. I even heard there's a seaweed that tastes like bacon now. I'm very curious about that one. But there are tons of different seaweeds out there and they could provide lots of nutritional value for us but they also are an emulsifier in foods. Emulsifier basically means a way that it brings um, different kinds of foods together. So if, for instance, if you ever make salad dressing at home, you might add some oil and vinegar, and if you mix, 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 right? Same thing, kind of like for chocolate milk, but if you mix it together, milk and chocolate, sometimes the chocolate drops down to the bottom, right? Or if you make that salad dressing, sometimes the oil and the vinegar will separate. An emulsifier, like if you add mustard, will mix with that vinegar and that oil and it'll make sure that the vinegar and oil stay together. Same thing for chocolate milk. Out in the stores, if you buy any kind of chocolate milk, um, you basically, well, have sometimes seaweed that's in there. Now, not seaweed chunks, but there are different properties of seaweed that emulsify, that keep that chocolate with that milk together. 
There's that also in um, a lot of toothpaste too, cosmetics, some ice creams. Uh, there are lots of different kelp properties that we use in our everyday life that we don't always think about. Um, I did get a question of what's your favorite seaweed dish or recipe? Ooh, one of my all-time favorites is actually this dish that I grew up eating called miyokuk. And miyokuk is a Korean uh, seaweed soup, and it is a lovely kind of um, broth that you make in it, and you put a lot of seaweed in it, and you add a little bit of rice, and it is delicious. There's some other ingredients in there too, but definitely miyokuk is my favorite, favorite way to eat seaweed. Um, what's your favorite way to eat seaweed? Feel free to text your answers on in. Maybe there's a really cool dish that we all can try. So feel free to send in your favorite seaweed dish right down here below. But now we've talked a little bit about how kelp is important for animals, how it's important as an ecosystem, but also how it, well, is important for, for humans too. Now, there are certain animals, though, that really depend on that kelp forest for survival. And some of them, unfortunately, um, haven't done so well due to overfishing within kelp forests. Kelp forests are a lovely resource, right? We can see a ton of varieties of fish. And one that I want to touch a little bit upon is this fun friend right here, this giant sea bass. Now, as you look at this giant sea bass, it's a gentle giant within our ocean, right? Um, ooh, looks like Seymour said seaweed wraps is his favorite. That's pretty cool. Mmm. Seymour, send in that recipe if you'd like. <laughs> but if we go on ahead and we see this giant sea bass, maybe it likes a little seaweed wrap too. Um, but with it, it has a really big mouth because it's an ambush predator where it just opens its mouth and the food just gets sucked right in. So... Because these animals are such large animals, they just move very slowly, that allows them to kind of stock and check out their food and then eat it usually in like one big gulp. Now because of that, they don't really have to move very fast, they don't have to expend a lot of energy, and believe it or not, they're very friendly to, to scuba divers too. And so because of that, and being so big, they also apparently happen to be quite tasty too. So they were fished down to very tiny numbers. And because these animals live up to 80 years old, um, you know, they, they take a little while to, to reproduce. And if they get fished to the point where there aren't that many, or there's only super young ones around, it takes a while for their populations to bounce back. And so we're still, we're, and they're also very kind of elusive. They span a wide range. And so it's really difficult for scientists to be able to count each and every one. But nowadays, we're actually able to track a lot of their population due to a citizen science program uh, through a wide variety of organizations, including the, including the aquarium. And so what we're able to do and, um, and what different scuba divers are able to do is they're able to take pictures of these giant sea bass and they're able to identify them by all their spots. So here we can see all the different spots that are on our sea bass friend, here, here, here and also on that one too. And they have each individual spots that help identify each particular variety. So they're kind of like snowflakes in regards to the different kinds of spot patterns that you see there. And so there's an algorithm that was developed that helped them to figure out which sea bass is, or who's who, right? You can tell by their wonderful smiles too, I'm sure, right, who is who. But, uh, but you're able to kind of track the sea bass over time. Hello, friends. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Maybe I was getting some sea bass kisses. But with these sea bass, right, you can see how gentle and slow that they move. Um, but that's one way that scientists and everyday public are able to go on ahead and track sea bass and see how well they're doing. And if they're moving from one place to another, um, have many folks see them, have only a few. So it's a really new, neat and new program that has been uh, developed. So that's one way that we're able to kind of help protect some of those sea bass. Now, otters are another variety of animal that live in the kelp forest, and they mainly focus in on that canopy, that very top part. Now, they use the canopy a little bit differently. Uh, they'll go on ahead and wrap themselves up in that, in that seaweed, and it'll help um, keep them in one spot, almost like a little anchor. So that way, if they fall asleep or maybe they have babies that they don't want to take down with them as they forage for food, they can wrap them up in that seaweed and keep them in one spot. So that way, when uh, mama otter comes back on up, she's able to find her baby there. 
Now, these sea otters, though, as great swimmers as they are, ah, here's a great picture. There's one even cleaning. So it's a nice way for them, too. If they wrap themselves up in kelp, they can stay right where they are, and they can go on ahead and clean and groove themselves right there. Right? So they also eat in the kelp forest, too. Um, and so they get a lot of their food, like abalone and urchins, um, and maybe even some, some clams, some shrimp even. Here's some feeding here at the aquarium. You can see they're very good eaters, right? They are very quick at de-shrimping, de-shelling those shrimp right there. Um, but for these otters, they, get, they have to eat about 25% of their body weight a day. You can see one enjoying a crab right there. Um, and so with these otters, they are constantly foraging for food and need that diversity within our kelp ecosystem. But the tricky thing is these sea otters, as cute as they are, their fur is incredible. They are incredibly, they're the most dense fur of any animal in the animal kingdom. If you hold up like an okay sign, basically there are a million hairs in that sign. It's same size as like a quarter, right? So there's a million hairs in there. For us, I think there's only about 10,000 hairs. So just to give you an idea of how much more dense the sea otter fur is, right? Now, because it's so dense, it's actually super duper soft, and it was used in a lot of trading back back long time ago. And so um, their furs were traded, and they were hunted uh, to the point where their numbers were very, very low. And so we're still trying to recover many of these sea otters um, and bring them back up to a population that is more sustainable. And so one way we're doing that is we've partnered with Monterey Bay Aquarium to be able to have a sea otter surrogacy program. So one of our newest otters, Millie, um, is helping to raise some sea otter pups. So basically, if a sea otter has been stranded without mama around, um, they are brought in and Millie can teach them how to be a sea otter, how to groom themselves how to forage for food, all of those basic skill sets. And then we're able to release that baby otter out into the wild now, you know, having all of those skills that it needs in order to succeed. And so that is one way that we are helping our sea otter populations here at the aquarium. Now the last animal, which is one of my personal favorites, and I'm sure one for all of you, because I'm sure it's like, well, kelp and, and charismatic animal go hand in hand. And if you're thinking what I'm thinking, that abalone, right? That is definitely one of our favorites here at the aquarium. Check it out. How can you not love the snail right here? Isn't it beautiful? Ah, one of my favorite snails for sure. Now you're thinking, wait, Jen, a snail? Why? Well, abalone? I, I don't, I don't get it. What's, what's the big deal here? Now, believe it or not, these are really good eats, or at least so I've heard. I've personally never had it, but these, well, do you think they're very fast moving? Not so much, right? They're very slow, kind of like our giant sea bass. And these abalone, if they ever feel, you know, kind of threatened, they can kind of hunker down a little bit into the rock and they have that hard shell that protects them. But otherwise, you can actually pry them off of the rocks if you have the right set of tools and the right skills. And so these were super easy to catch and super tasty if prepared correctly. And so these were eaten by the dozens, by the hundreds, by the thousands, so much so that if you look at some history books, there are piles and piles and piles of abalone shells just as high as you can see. In fact, their populations were so low that basically they, are, they were the first invertebrate put on the endangered species list. Yep. So all the other animals, like our sea otter friends, right, uh, they all have that backbone. But these animals are the first non-backbone animals, first invertebrates that were on that list. And so there are, I want to say about like nine varieties or thereabouts of, sea, of abalone. Oh, seven. Thank you, Alicia. Right there are about seven different varieties. And here at the aquarium, we are working on trying to bring some of those abalone numbers back up. Um, so we're working on trying to grow these abalone along with a handful of other institutions and organizations to really bring their numbers back to Southern California. They have had a wide variety of struggles, and so we're hoping to be able to provide a helping hand to bring them back out into the wild. 
Ah, friends, unfortunately, we are all out of time, but something that I'd like for you to be thinking about are ways that you might be able to help our oceans, help some of these animals back here. Is it going to be, you know, responsibly eating seafood and trying to make sure that maybe you're eating sustainably, right? That these populations can be around for a long time. Maybe it's just getting to learn more about these animals and spread what you know to other folks, right? There's so many different ways that you too can help our oceans. I'm really excited to maybe hear about some of those ways. So feel free to go on ahead and text or email us maybe some ways that you think might be great to be able to help our oceans. Number 562. 286-1838, or better yet, because we're just about ready to end our program today, go on ahead and email us at live at lbaop.org. Well, thanks friends for joining us on this very Kelpie day, and I hope you have a great rest of your Thursday. Bye.